Teachers with disabilities exist in small but impactful numbers. How do they navigate their journey? What are the challenges? What are the benefits to patients and to their peers? And what can we learn from their experiences? Join us as we explore the stories of doctors, PAs, nurses, OTs, PTs, pharmacists, dentists, and other health professionals with disabilities. We'll also be interviewing the researchers and policymakers that drive medicine forward towards real equity and inclusion. My name is Lisa Meeks. And I am Peter Poulos. And we are thrilled to bring you the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Hello, and welcome back to the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Today, we bring you the continuation of our series on voices of Black, Indigenous, people of color with disabilities in medicine. These episodes amplify the voices of healthcare providers at the intersection of disability and BIPOC identity, enlightening our understanding of challenges for multiple marginalized populations. By elevating these stories and sharing these lived experiences, We hope to advance critical conversations about race and disability and facilitate a greater understanding of the challenges and benefits at the intersections. Funding for this project was provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Together, we believe that a culture of health requires the dismantling of structural racism and ableism so that everyone has a chance to live a healthy life. In this first episode of the series, we are joined by Andrea Dalzell, also known as the Seated Nurse. As someone who has used a wheelchair full-time since the age of 12, Andrea understands what it's like to constantly come up against barriers as she navigates a world often not built with disabled people in mind, and has devoted her career to advocating for and working to support people with disabilities. In this episode, Andrea, Dr. Meeks, and Dr. Poulos discuss the strengths and challenges that having a disability and other marginalized identities has presented in her journey to become a nurse, as well as her visions for future disabled nursing and healthcare professionals as she drives forward her ongoing advocacy and education work. We begin with an introduction from Andrea. My name is Andrea, and I want to thank you for having me on this podcast. I am a registered nurse. I'm affectionately known as the seated nurse on all social media. And I think that the powerhouse behind the fact that I'm a nurse with a disability is the fact that I'm the first nurse to go through nursing education in New York State using a wheelchair full time. And I think that's a pivotal point that I graduated school in 2018. And I'm the first for New York State. That's kind of mind boggling as I've pushed forth these last four years advocating for persons with disabilities to be seen in STEM, but primarily seen in the healthcare field, because We know that our population is aging and with aging comes illness that brings on disability. And then we have a healthcare system that is unaware and doesn't have the verbiage to necessarily help these people not only transition into new lives with different types of abilities, but also just see a life with a disability. And I think that is super important from the healthcare standpoint, being that I also speak on how we're able to narrate someone's life based on what we've read in a textbook. And I think that at this point in time, 2018, when technology has literally gotten us to have pictures on Mars, see galaxies light years away, that we've transitioned from wheelchairs that were wooden to now being modified to fit every aspect of our bodies to having technologies to bring us back to life, that we're still using terminology that is demeaning and putting a bias and boxing in people, especially as we transition into this next phase of growing older and this population that's coming forth. I follow you. I'm a super fan girl. So (laughs) sorry to embarrass you. I'm so excited to be here today with you. To what extent do you think that 
your advocacy and the work that you're spearheading has made actionable changes in accommodations in the workplace and in your workplace. How do you think it's impacting other people and how they can access accommodations as well? Well, let's take it out of the workforce for one second and just bring back the advocacy to education. We know that the ADA covers education, but at the same time, a lot of people who are signing up for STEM programs, and I want to say STEM because STEM encompasses healthcare. And as we are healthcare workers, and I am in healthcare, a large part of our introduction to healthcare is STEM. What accommodations in the educational level are being placed in STEM? A lot of people have a difficult time doing mathematic problems because programming isn't available for them to do it. Not that it isn't out there or the technology isn't out there. It's just that maybe a facility doesn't have that technology yet, doesn't know about the technology. We know that information isn't widely disseminated unless we're on social media at this point. And we also know that technology costs money. So then when you throw it towards the chemistry sectors being pushed into a lab where you're either on crutches or you have some type of physical disability that's visible, there's an automatic stop sign for you because now there's a danger point that no one knows how to navigate or no one talks about in a real time situation that becomes an edited note in a journal that now we know that these individuals can do something other than what biases we perceive and throw onto them. And that's just at the educational level. So now if you've gotten through education and you've navigated your way around the red tape at that sector, now it transitioned over into your career. And your career is now taking everything that education said that we've gotten you through and saying, well, now we can't provide it because your accommodation may cost too much. When we know that those studies also show that this is something that we've made up in our minds because we just don't want to think about the extra work that may be put forth because someone is asking for any type of accommodation. Again, because information is not readily available and disseminated so that people understand that there are accommodations that are free and are accessible and can be provided or even grants that help businesses to provide these accommodations for individuals that may ask or request for them. I think when we really think about the bigger picture, we're really just saying that we're throwing our own perception of what our immortality looks like and saying, we don't want to deal with that right now. So hide it away. Let's not help this person and let them find something else to do. That's another really good point that you bring up that people may not even be getting to the place where they can apply to nursing school or apply to any of the health profession schools because they're getting stuck in that prerequisite STEM space. And you know what's so interesting to me is that I have so many faculty who reach out to me and chairs of departments who say have all of this, as you said, grants, funding to support accommodations and inclusion for people with disabilities in STEM. They're actively seeking people So where's the bottleneck, right? Is the bottleneck the admissions folks who aren't getting this messaging? Is the bottleneck the disability folks who are saying, oh, this is not possible? But I think, to your point, education is a huge part of it. I think people don't know what they don't know. And so it may be that we're all living in an ableist society. We're taught through an ableist lens. So they're making assumptions about ability. And you don't even hit the people who actually might champion this. So that's one aspect of barrier that you've brought up, right? The fulfilling the prerequisites to even be able to apply. What are some other barriers specific for nurses that you think exist in this environment for disability? Well, let's take a deep dive into when I started nursing school. And I'm going to bring up a name, Gloria Ramsey. She is who I have acknowledged as the first African-American woman with a disability who got through nursing school in the 80s. So that's in and of itself is huge. So that's the 1980s. Now let's fast forward. Again, I graduated in 2018 and I'm going to talk about four distinct barriers. One was the application process for nursing school. The application process goes down the list of saying, what are your abilities? Basically, do you have no inability? Can you stand for 12 hours? Can you lift up to 15 pounds? Can you do all of these things? Now, I can understand the gist of asking these questions. And at the same time, 
I can't compare standing for 12 hours and sitting for 12 hours, right? And that's coming from a person who is a wheelchair user. Now let's put that onto something else. 12 hours with type 1 diabetes and not being able to check your insulin. Now let's also throw that onto someone who may have broken a wrist. And yes, I can stand for 12 hours, but don't ask me to do CPR for 20 minutes because my wrist was broken and I now have pins, right? We're not creating a language that really involves what the human experience is. And that's where the problem lies. When you're applying for nursing school and I'm now submitting documentation that my doctor says, no, I can't stand for 12 hours, but can sit. Nursing school now shifts through this paperwork. What do you mean you can't stand for 12 hours? That's the requirement of the job. Time out a second. I'm not applying for a job. I'm applying for education. I'm applying for a right to get to the NCLEX and then pass a test that says that I have embodied the knowledge that you have given me. Now, if you want to use the credentialing that careers are using, then why are we not saying that nursing students are going into the facilities and then they're only partnered with a nurse? They're not partnered with another student nurse. And then that means that they're also giving medications like they're an LPN already, or they're already going through everything that the career requires without having your NCLEX already settled. So if these arbitrary requirements are due right at the door of nursing school, you're already turning people away. Now, if you're thinking about someone who doesn't have any disability at all at the forefront, there's nothing that they claim as a disability. And let's say there's a car accident during the semester. Now you're in a cast for six weeks. This nursing school will say, no, you have to drop this semester because now that cast is an infection risk. Well, you're not touching patients at the at their full extent. During nursing school, again, you're just gaining the information. You're supposed to be embodying me to be empowered to pass the boards. Yes, we understand that we need to be hands-on, but a large portion of nursing is when you've already gotten the job, when you're hands-on training, and then you have to take that textbook knowledge and transition it into physical knowledge. Whereas this is different for our counterparts in PA school or MDs or DOs. We know that they're literally hands-on the moment that they're in school. They need to touch, feel, listen, Everything is encompassed into their educational part and then after residency. This doesn't happen for nurses. You have either 18 months of an LPN program, two years of an ADN program, maybe three to four years of a BSN program. And in all that time, just to get through the NCLEX, you're put into a clinical practice, but you're not ever alone. You have to be paired with another student. You're giving what you're lineup is and what you can and cannot do, who is overseeing you as you do something, hand over hand almost. And then we say you got through the education part and and then your career, you can't do it. We automatically close you off. So there's a lot of nuances between the educational part that already hinders students. And then there's another part that hinders them again when it comes to the career part. And then we also think that nurses are only meant to be in a hospital setting. A lot of people say, oh, you're a nurse. Where do you work? What hospital do you work at? That's the first inkling they think, as though nurses are only there to be at the bedside hands-on with patients. When we know nurses are in a vast majority of different fields that literally help our community continue to grow, but we only think about them as being hands-on, patient-lifting, patient-forward, always. How did you get through what sorts of accommodations or modifications did you need and how did your school deal with it? So I've spoken about this before and maybe this is a great time to highlight my school. At the very beginning, they were hesitant. They didn't know how to best help me. And they would go behind me and talk to our disability office and try to get their input. And I would fight back and say, there's no way they can talk on my behalf. I've never been a nurse before, so I don't know what accommodations I'm going to need until I need them. The only thing I really did know was that I had extreme anxiety and test taking for me was like I would fail within a heartbeat if you were going to put me into the time constraints of this test. 
So I did have a time and a half. So I had a lot of time that all of students had, and then I had an extra half hour on top of that to be able to get through my exams, calm my anxiety down and focus. The only other accommodation I had was one of my clinical sites was up a hill and they didn't allow student nurses to park in their parking lot. And I was given the accommodation to be able to park in the parking lot so that I can get into the building easier. But that was me just being vocal and saying, I saw my clinical site, it's up a hill. I'm not going to be able to park on this hill and get up to the site in a timely manner or in any manner, just in case it snowed, rain, and they were able to accommodate there. But I don't know what other accommodations... I could have asked for, but I didn't. And I think that was because I labeled myself having to be perfect in order to just be seen as equal. And I could not fill a test. It was, please don't give them a reason to get me out of the program. Just notice that I'm a student. And I was never really given that part, just be a student. It was always, tell me what accommodations you need. How is your disability going to play out? Even in a clinical practice, I'm in infection control. How do we control infection risk? And I would always have to say, this is an evidence-based practice and you don't have evidence of me bringing in an infection and yet you're throwing this at me as a precaution. But we know that this is just blatant bias because again, we're evidence-based practice. It's the physician's ties that are the culprits. (laughs) Going around right. from bedside to bedside. The white coats, in, the white coats. The white coats and the ties. <laughs> right. They're like, well, how would you touch your wheels and then and touch a patient? I was like, I can triple glove. I can wash my hands. I can glove up three times. I'm probably the cleanest person because of the fact that I can wipe down almost every part of my beat. I can lock into place. There's so many things that I do that's different, but seen as more of a hindrance than something that can be helpful or useful. You mentioned rolling around the room and how is that for you examining patients or dealing with equipment in the hospital or clinic setting? Well, can we be real about one thing? We all know that there's no hospital setting. There's no clinic setting that is 100% accessible for anyone, let alone the patient, let alone the worker. For me, when I was working during COVID, I worked night shift. So the offgoing nurse while we're giving report, I would ask for them their help to set my room. So if I needed to move the bed a certain way, if I needed to move some stuff out of the room, I would just set the room with my offgoing nurse as we're doing report to make sure that I can get to everything that I needed to be able to get to. Our little computer on wheels, our wows, I made sure that was stocked. I would get in a little earlier. Again, this the sense of being perfect so that I fly under the radar versus staying in sight of whoever is watching. I never wanted to be there. I always wanted to just make sure that I was ready and able to do what I needed to do in in a moment's notice. And I think that anyone with any disability can understand the fact that we think 150 steps ahead because we want to try to fly under the radar and just be seen as an equal playing partner, even though we may not be. And I think that kind of does a disservice to us as healthcare workers with disabilities, because then we start to neglect our own needs. And we start to put everything else in front of what we need and say that we have to get it done versus I need to take care of me first versus everything else. But you are still, it sounds like, as am I, I have a volunteer program where pre-med students shadow me and help me throughout the day. And then they get to be in the clinical setting. But what you're describing with your colleagues is like active helping of your friends, essentially, right? That in and of itself is a workaround. There's no obligation on their part to help you set your room. Oh, definitely no obligation at all. But let's also think about it. I'm making sure that their lines and everything is set for when they're coming back in in the morning. Their bags aren't running dry. I'm not saying that at the end of the day, I'm not going to stay a little bit later to help you just as much. When we understand nursing, we understand that there's a team aspect that goes on, especially right now with what's happening across the country. Nurses are striking. I'm in New York City. We have 10,000 plus nurses that are striking this week because of the fact that we don't have safe staffing ratios. And now Mm -hmm. we're thinking about how does that transfer to care of our patients? Well, if we didn't have those safe staffing ratios to begin with, then we have to be in a team effort in order to get through our shifts. And that team effort can convey in any 
type of way. If I'm asking an offgoing nurse to help me set the room, then in the morning, she knows that everything that she needs is going to be ready and and available for her because it's a trade-off on our team. I may need help in one way, but you may need help in another, and therefore we make sure that it happens. Nursing is that profession that understands that without the team, we fail. And at the end of the day, especially what we've just come through with this pandemic and what we're still seeing today is that without the nurses as the backbone and that that underlying team, then everything else pretty much kind of falls apart. And we have to rely on each other to kind of get through it. And it's the same thing I did in, in nursing school. When I couldn't do something, my teammates were right there for me. And those are just my nursing pairs. And when they couldn't do something, I was good at IVs and I'm good at being able to get a patient to open up because my vulnerability is on my sleeve. I'm the one rolling in saying, what's up? And there's a whole dynamic shift. So it's how we look at the situation and not really think that there's a burden to one or another, but how best can we help each other? While Andrea had demonstrated the multitude of ways in which disabled nurses could be supported to succeed in their careers, convincing others in healthcare of their belonging, as well as her own, had continued to be met with resistance. Follow along as she reflects on the impact that others' perceptions of her multiple identities had on her education and employment, as well as the significant value that including and supporting more disabled professionals in the healthcare workforce could add to patient care. In what ways do you think medical institutions can commit to shifting the burden of change away from providers with disabilities so the institutions themselves can be more proactive rather than reactive? Well, we need to embrace that EEOC statement that's on the bottom of every one of their applications and their projects and their sign-ons, right? The Equal Opportunity Employment Commission says that we equally employ everyone without bias, right? So if you're going to do that, then that means your HR department is already ready for someone who's coming in with a disability and there to ask for accommodations, in which case then your employee wouldn't even feel uncomfortable to ask because it's already widely known that we are here to help you and we want to see you grow, where that's not usually the case, especially in nursing. Nursing is seen as the burden on the system because we spend the money, technically. We're not really the ones bringing in the value to the hospital, even though the value is in how we care for our patients. It's it's a different dynamic there. The doctors are the ones that bring in the money and the nurses are the ones that kind of spend it. And, and that's the dynamic. So when you're thinking about the institution and how they really see that EEOC statement play out in the profession of nursing itself. You really have to think of how much more extra are we willing to go. And again, accommodations aren't extra. It's just allowing for someone to be physically present there. How does that then commit value back to the institution, even though we're the spenders? It's by saying that the patient that's in that room that just got that spinal cord injury diagnosis is probably going to see life a little bit different if they have a nurse in a wheelchair. That person who's losing their hearing may have a nurse that is hearing impaired and already signing and can start to teach them sign. And then there's a better outlook of what life looks like. There's someone who may have a diagnosis of MS that's going to be progressive and may see someone down the line limping in their hallway who's actively present in that system and can ask that question of how they're doing it. It brings a value of saying that your human life goes further than your diagnosis. But institutions are more afraid of the liability that it's going to bring versus the value. We talk a lot about people with disabilities and we talk a lot about the BIPOC population and the two distinct issues of these groups. But for me, I feel like so much of it is overlapped. So much of the behavior and the assumption about people is weaved throughout both of these, through racism and ableism. What are your thoughts about that? And how do you navigate that space? It's hard. It's what I call my three strikes. I'm a woman. I happen to identify as African-American and I have a disability. All of these things can hinder me at some point in any process. And I have to know what's in front of me to pivot around or to address directly. And I can tell you, yes, I went through 76 plus interviews 
for a clinical position. And the only time that that changed was at the peak of COVID in New York City when all nurses needed hands on deck. Like our governor put out the mandate for people to come out of retirement. So at that point, I knew I had an in. But why did it take that amount of effort? To get 76 in-person interviews means that I submitted over 3,000 applications to the tri-state area medical systems. This is all dialysis clinics. These are hospital settings, rehabs, outpatient, pre-op, everything. I have submitted thousands upon thousands of applications to clinical settings because my goal was to become a CRNA. That was it. I want to go and be a nurse anesthetist and anesthesiologist, and that's what I want. And the only way to do that was to become an ICU nurse particularly in in cardiac care or high-level ICU care. And in order to do that, you have to have a clinical position. You have to get those hours in. So that's what I was looking for. And I got turned away from every single one, 76 of them. And I can tell you that I went through the wave. I would meet with all types of nurse managers and HR directors. And instantly, the first thing is, oh, she's in a wheelchair. And then you would also see the dynamic switch in how they spoke to me. Well, you understand why. No, I don't understand why. You need to lay it out for me. And they kind of would dance around. Sometimes it would be directly to the wheelchair where they would say infection control or they would say it's a risk factor or you will not be able to see at that height. And then sometimes they would turn it around and and there's no way to really describe language, but tone and body maneuvers can say a lot. And whether you can conjoin it to having the disability or me being a woman or me being Black, all of them, yes, do kind of merge together at some point. But particularly being a woman of color, tone and body movement can play a part in how you reject someone. And I think if anyone has ever seen any of my Instagram posts where I was documenting all of my interviews... There were days where I go into this interview knowing that I had a chance. I got through, it was my third time. I'm meeting with the chief nurse officer. I'm meeting with the nurse manager of the unit. And it would probably be a male or it would be a female who is not BIPOC. And I would come out of this interview and just go to the car and cry. Because you have to hold a certain professionalism. I can't show that I'm angry. I can't show that I'm displeased. I have to maintain a hat that allows me to be in this door. And should I be vocal in the wrong way or speak up, does that now blackball me from other places? So there's a fine line to be had having those three strikes. There is a fine line and you have to play the part because as a woman of color, I don't know what door I'm opening for someone else. And what door I may be closing for someone else just being in the building. Uh, It's so heartbreaking to me to hear you kind of relive your experience. And I do think there's so much more pressure. You talked early on in the interview about having to be better just to be the same. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when you go into the interview and you're bringing the identity of being a woman of color, you have to be calm just to be the same. You are somebody that has a bachelor's degree in nursing, correct? I have a master's. master's. All right. (laughs) You have a master's degree in nursing. You've passed the NCLEX. Yes. You are qualified. I am qualified. There is literally no other reason not to hire you. And in the middle of a pandemic, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out the disability or the combination of disability and identity as being a BIPOC individual had to have played in this process. And that is so disheartening, especially in a progressive place like New York. I don't know if I'm disappointed or disheartened as much as I, no, I am disappointed, not because of it's New York, but because we're in 2023 at the time, 2018. We've already faced this, like I said, with Gloria Ramsey in 1980s. Fast forward 30 years, we're still in the same place. And that doesn't make sense to me because, again, as an evidence-based practice, as a practice that continues to evolve around our communities, even in just healthcare, where we have exponentially grown because of technology, we're still 30 years behind the curve. 
what does that mean if we're doing that for our students, if we're doing that for our employees, then how are we treating our community? Exactly. And how does that then play out into their care? Because at the end of the day, as a patient, on the patient side of my life, I understand and now I see too much and know too much. And I can't allow for patients to understand the flip side. Because I'm here advocating for more of me in their building so that their care can now meet where it should be and where it should have been 30 years ago when we were already having this discussion with other people, where we didn't have the technology in place to make it happen, where we didn't have the accessibility that we had of the ADA in 1990. And though we have so much further to go, we shouldn't be 30 years behind. You led us straight to what my next question was. We often ask interviewees to reflect on how do you think your presence impacts patient care? How do you think you being in the room, in the profession, changes patient care for people with disabilities? Do you want to know when I knew I was supposed to be a nurse? So a little backstory here. I never wanted to be a nurse. I wanted to be a doctor. Actually, before that, I wanted to be a lawyer because I had told my doctors growing up that I was going to come back and sue them for all the pain that they put me through that they were on the chopping block. And my doctor, my beloved, I love him so much, Dr. David Feldman, I was released from the hospital to go to my graduation. And he wrote in my memory book, please, anything but a lawyer. I said, okay, well, if you can't beat them, join them, right? So I'm going to go and I'm going to become a neurologist and I am going to discover the cure to pain. And that was my gun ho. I'm going to do that. And then after finishing like biology in undergrad, I was like, okay, I'm going to go for medical school. And then I realized in auditing medical school classes, and this is not bashing my physician friends or anyone else, is that a lot of, of the medical model is to understand that the illness is, that's it. You're working on the illness and how to best treat this person's illness. And you are the diagnosis. You forget the person's whole holistic implementation that goes on to their care. We get little touches here and there, but we don't really look into that deeply. We are looking at the diagnosis and how best to help this get through. Whereas it's the nurses and the social workers and everyone else is trying to help you live your life with your diagnosis. And the doctors are the ones that's like, let's help this diagnosis and try to either cure it and help you live with it. I could never be the person that comes into the room and says, you will never. I heard those words as a kid. I can never give that to someone else because I felt like that was the worst gift someone could have given me was to tell me that I could never do something. So to have that terminology right then and there, I knew that life was going to be different and I didn't want to be a neurologist anymore. Mind you, I graduated with a neurology degree. So what do I do with this? <laughs> it was in talking to one of my own personal nurses that she said, why don't you be a nurse? You'll take care of the whole patient, the family. You can, you can do anything with that and you can move up with that as well. So I went on to decide that I was going to be a nurse. It took me a year to put in an application because I didn't see myself as being a nurse. And then after I got into nursing school, it took me another me a year and a half to finish because I already had my prerequisites done. But just shifting in to actually see myself as a nurse after passing NCLEX was very hard. It wasn't until I was in a clinical setting, I had my fellow nursing students around me. I had a patient that was fine. I was almost done all of my work for the day and she was having a difficult time with the patient. She asked me if I can come help get vitals. And I was like, okay, sure, no problem. And as soon as I rolled into the room, this woman starts crying. And I said, go get the professor. Something must be wrong. So I just roll over to her. I was like, can I get your vitals? I'm like, why are you crying? Can you take some deep breaths for me? Just focus on me. And she says to me, I thought my life was over. She had just had a CVA, so new stroke victim. Um, she was now hemiplegic and in rehab. And nurses were saying that she wouldn't get out of bed. She wouldn't go to therapy. And, you know, she was taking her new diagnosis extremely hard. Life is over for her. And here you are seeing me roll into the room, assessing you as, as a nurse. In her mind, I'm a nurse. I'm a nursing student at, the, at that point. And asking you to take deep breaths and taking care of you. And she said, my, I thought my life was over. And in that moment, you may hear me kind of crack up a little bit because I think at that moment, I also knew why I was supposed to be a nurse um, and why my trajectory changed. 
was because now someone else saw her life moving forward versus being over. And from that day forward, she was up going to therapy, going to rehab. I don't know where she is in the world now. And I, and I wish her well, whoever, whoever they are now, but you know, at that moment, they don't know how much they gave back to me in the moment that I gave back to them. And I think that it's super important to see physicians and nurses and any, any career embody disability that's visible and invisible because it again is human nature. We don't get away from this. We don't get to say that we, we don't get a disability in life. It's the one minority that anyone and everyone can join at any given point in their life at any given time and to look away from it and not to be seen on TV, in media, as our, as our nurses, our doctors, our teachers, what are we saying? Are we saying that life is over? So it's extremely important to actually see us and know, even if you don't have a visible disability, speak about your invisible disability so that others understand that life goes on and that life doesn't just stay at a diagnosis and a diagnosis can be different for everyone. In the following section, Andrea describes the many roles she takes on in her current and ongoing work, the aims of her 501c3 nonprofit, The Seated Nurse, and the tremendous impact that efforts like hers could have on inclusion and sense of belonging of people with disabilities in healthcare professions. So the seated position has started up. It is up and running. I do directly consult with nursing schools and with nursing students to navigate the nursing profession from the educational level into career level. And I'm also talking about DEI plus A, like making sure that the accessibility is a part of the DEI talk and conversation. Because as we know right now, DEI has been a little bit performative and what we're supposed to be looking out for versus taking the actionable items and making sure that they are in place for those that are coming through the door the moment we say we're hiring. I hope our audience hears that. Andrea Delazal, and she's available to consult with you for all of you nursing schools who are looking for disability awareness information as part of DEI. That's so important, and there's such a need, and so few people who are doing that. Is this your main focus now, the seated position, or are you working in a clinic? Or so I, I have a bunch of different hats right now. I'm a consultant for a non for profit in the city. I'm also on the board for the Access Project, where huh? I'm also the medical director for them. And I am running their virtual programming at this point. I also do consulting for a private school in Lower Manhattan, where I oversee LPN nurses and their day to days with neurodivergent students that attend that private school. And then again, I have my own non for profit, the seated position. So there's many different hats going on right now and definitely pivoted the way my nursing career has transformed. But then on the flip side, I also am a speaker and I educate and I make sure that nurses understand what it is that they can do and can't do and how to kind of best facilitate understanding self ability. That way they can convey it, whether they are in a nursing program in a STEM program or going forth into anything that they may try to be doing. You know, I feel like nursing might be more ableist than medicine. Have well, you ever had that conversation? I would agree with you. I would agree with you because of the fact that they will tell you that the doctor is with you for what, 30 minutes out of your day, but your nurse is with you for 12 hours. We eat three meals with you. It's a little bit different. Um, nurses are required to ambulate, get a patient up, get them to the bathroom. We are taking care of them, turning Q4, Q2. There's a lot of hands-on that goes on with nursing and wound care. But again, we project that nursing is only at the bedside. It's only hands-on care. When we know that there's some nurses that are working as triage or ciders for doctors, right? We're on the computers and making sure that someone's arrhythmias aren't coming back. We are doing telehealth and we are also in informatics, making sure that those infection control risks aren't spiking because of the numbers that we're able to pull through. We're the ones that are actually creating 
a lot of the mm-hmm. systems that doctors are using online. A lot of the input we know comes from insurance companies, but we won't go there. But (laughs) and the meat and potatoes is the nurses that are behind the work that we're actually doing in those hospital systems and in those clinics. But there's a lot of nursing that's outside of it. And we don't usually talk about that. What about the case managers that are really, you know, doing the homework to make sure that patients can stay in their home and can live those functional lives? We're not talking about that side anymore. And we forget that there's that whole side to nursing that exists. And when we forget that side of nursing exists, that's where these biases come in saying that education means you have to be able to lift 15 pounds. You have to be able to stand. When I was asked if I can put an IV bag up, I said, well, what do your short nurses do? What about the nurses that are like four foot 11? What are their accommodations? Oh, they use a step stool. Stool. Cool. Can you give me a, a, a IV pole that goes up and down? Like those are things that I would come back with. Like, tell me what they would do. Again, we put a secular focus on what someone can't do when we can visibly see it because we can't think about our own morality doing that. And it's not for us to think about what they can and cannot do. It's for them to tell us what they may have issues with and may need some help with and for them to ask those accommodations. But also, again, remembering that we have to keep the door open for them to come to us and say they need it and feel comfortable enough to say that they need it. You know, Pete, we've never talked about this, but I'm curious. I've often felt like physicians have been deemed this godlike profession and that they internalize that. And then when they see someone who's disabled, who wants to join the profession, it's like, oh, wait, because we are this superior profession or the superior being, we don't want people with disabilities in our profession. Kind of similar to what Andrea is saying about you see your own mortality when you see someone who hasn't acquired or a lifelong disability and it scares you and you don't want to see or interact with that every day. I know it's off topic, but I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. I mean, I had a guy in my class in medical school who was a wheelchair user. He was the only person that I knew with like a visible disability that I trained with in school and afterwards. So didn't really have that exposure. I mean, he had some accommodations in the anatomy lab. I think that his table was lower and I didn't really think twice about it. It just seemed normal that somebody in a wheelchair could be a doctor with some accommodations. Look at I that know, I was because it was, because it was integrated. Like I was integrated in my class. No one knew what my fight was outside of the classroom, outside of my little pod of nurses that were my backbone. But look at that to not even think, okay, yes, he's a part of the class and it's normal. But that person probably went through barriers upon obstacles to try to even get to that point of saying he had a lower table in anatomy. Yeah. <laughs> You know, Lisa writes about the upward spiral of having people with disabilities as peers and colleagues and how that changes your perspective on disability and ultimately decreases stigma and then hopefully impacts the care of patients with disabilities through decreased stereotyping and stigma. And I think that that is absolutely true. You did that for your class. The guy did it in my class. I did it for my colleagues. Just having somebody in the room makes a huge difference. As the conversation comes to a close, Andrea shares her advice for students and trainees navigating their own journeys with disabilities in healthcare. I used to always say, Find your yes and stick with it. No one else's no is as powerful as your own yes. So, and I think for 2023, we'll kind of switch that up a little bit and just remember why you want to do something. If your why is just as powerful as your yes, then just keep going. No one is going to be able to stop you. Your why is just as empowering and just don't give up. And I know that sounds super cliche to not give up and it's so much easier to give up. Trust me, I've tried. But there's always something that eats away at you when you give up. Why didn't I do something? I should have done it sooner. I could have done this. And if your why for doing it is just as strong and you understand your purpose, then just keep going. Keep going. Don't let someone else negate you from what it is that you want to achieve. 
I was interviewing someone actually that aired Conrad Addison, amazing sleep medicine. Sleep medicine. And he yeah. said he was struggling with whether he could stay in medicine. He acquired a disability in medical school and Pete's story helped get him through. And actually Pete, I don't know that you remember, but he reached out to you and you responded and he said it was the game changer. So I think Andrea, by coming onto the show and sharing your story, we've attacked medicine pretty hard. We can start picking away at nursing and it's really important. I want to stress that you are available for talks and trainings and consultation yes. um, on DEIA focused events. And it sounds like for clinical items as well, and maybe some professional development items, how would people get a hold of you? So they can either email the seated nurse at gmail.com. They can go to the website, the seated nurse.com. All of my social media handles are available at the seated nurse as well as reaching out to my team at info at the mic drop agency.com. That's awesome. I'm really grateful to you for coming on today. Thank you for having me. This is so much fun. <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrea, for taking the time to generously share the experience and wisdom you've accrued in your life and career and for your ongoing work in disability advocacy. To our audience, thank you so much for joining us. Remember, this is the first of a three-part continuation of our series highlighting BIPOC disabled folks in medicine. So if you enjoyed this discussion, be sure to subscribe to our podcast, check out our previous interviews, and tune in again next time. This podcast is a production of the Docs with Disabilities Initiative and is supported by a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation with additional support from the Stanford Medicine Alliance for Disability Inclusion and Equity and the University of Michigan Medical School Department of Family Medicine and Disability Initiative. The opinions on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the hosts, their respective institutions, or the funders. This podcast is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Non-Derivative License. This episode was produced by Lisa Meeks, Sophia Schlossman, and Nicole Kim, with support from our audio editor, Jacob Feeman.